Hello and welcome once more to Conscious TV. I'm Ian McNay and our guest today is Jason Shulman. Hi, Hi Jason. Ian. Hi, nice to be here. And Jason is a painter, musician, teacher and healer and he's written a couple of books, uh, one called Kabbalistic Healing and one called The Instruction Manual for Receiving God. I have a copy here. So we're going to talk about his life and about and about his work basically. So Jason there was one quote I pulled out of one of your books yeah. which I found interesting and it's um, from a prayer mantra of Judaism and the mantra is here O Israel the Lord our God the Lord is one mm -hmm. and you translate that as listen you who struggle to figure out what reality, what reality is reality is one. Yeah. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, that, that prayer is uh, its a very central prayer in, in Judaism. It's called the Shema. In Hebrew, it's Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echod. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And even in the original translation, not my translation, it's a powerful statement. <clears throat> God is one. And that's a, a, a prayer that I took as my mantra when I was working on my own spiritual path, as I began my spiritual path, because I kind of threw everything that I did up against that benchmark. Was I dividing the world or was I seeing the oneness of the mm. world? And the translation that I use with my students, as you said, is, listen, you, you know, the word Israel, hero Israel, Israel means those who wrestle with God. So I translated it as, Listen, you who are struggling with reality, to find out what reality is, mm. it's a single thing. Mm. And that really is the hallmark of my whole perspective. My perspective is that God or uh, consciousness has to be a single thing, which means it's really up to us in a certain way to be able to use everything that we find in our human life including, for instance, our imperfections and difficulties and our suffering, to come into the presence of God, to find our real self, and to not try to cut away parts of ourselves in order to find some golden kernel inside, but rather take the point of view that the entire thing is the, is the lotus, the entire thing is the diamond. The entire thing, when we know how to use it, when we know how to look at it and work with it. So that was a very central part of my own spiritual education, that mm. prayer. And that, for almost everybody, is very challenging. Yes. Because it means the other yeah. is also me. Yes. Yeah. Well, I had enough trouble with me. <laughs> that <laughs> that, that I, 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 other people came later. Okay. As I got into Kabbalah, I realized that Kabbalah was about uh, the main theme of this universe, which, uh, from my perspective, is relationship. Everything in this universe, from from atoms, from strings to atoms to galaxies to planets to plants, to everything um, uh, is about relationship. Nothing exists without relationship. The Buddhists mm -hmm. understand this as well. And um, uh, for myself, I really had to come into relationship with myself, my disparate parts, my own suffering, before I could really come into a relationship with other people. And uh, of course, that's the ultimate, isn't it? To be in a relationship with everything, mm. including others. Yeah, well, let's have a look at your story to some extent, because it's an interesting journey you've had. So you grew up. Jewish, obviously, but mm -hmm. you turn quite early to Zen Buddhism. <clears throat> yes, yes. Well, you know, growing up Jewish meant that it was exactly the opposite of mysticism. It, like every other mainstream religion, it meant that I grew up in a Jewish congregation with Jewish prayers from a book. There was nothing original about it. You were asked to find your place within an already created world, right? My, <clears throat> my nature was very different. Now, I was always looking for the truth of something that I felt very deeply in myself, 
but couldn't actuate. I couldn't live it, but I felt this tremendous so you, truth. You, you knew it was there. I, I absolutely knew yeah. it was there. Mm -hmm. I absolutely knew from a very early age that there was mm, life and death and that there was something more that was a combination of both that there was uh, 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 ignorance and enlightenment and something that was combined both of them as well. Mm -hmm. I knew this. I didn't know how to articulate it. And I also had a personality that had enough flaws and bumps in the road that I wasn't able to live what I suspected was true. Mm -hmm. So a lot of my own spiritual path was to reconcile these opposites to try to find, uh, I was determined, quite frankly, to include everything. Uh, in fact, if I would say for 20 years, I was trying to find the, the unity between my birth religion, which was a deistic religion, where God is something uh, separate, and you pray to God, and you try to be with God, and so on, and my Buddhist studies, which um, didn't talk about God and talked about oneness and was very holistic. It felt to me that if there was a truth in the universe, that it had to include both of these views. Mm -hmm. And really, a lot of my spiritual upbringing, my path, was to try to reconcile these two seemingly opposite perspectives until such time as they did reconcile completely for me. And um, uh, that, was, uh, that was a major part of my path. Yeah. Mm. So I know you found the book uh, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. Yes. And you yeah. went to see Suzuki Roshi. Yes. And yes. you didn't understand anything he said the first time. No, nothing. But something, something was drawing you there. It was, it was, again, another one of those moments where I was sitting in the room I had wandered with a, a good friend of mine who uh, later became president of Zen Center. Um, and we didn't even know what a, uh, we had been sitting by ourselves in a little room. We would set a timer for five minutes and meditate, uh, looking at the timer to see if it stopped about five times during those five minutes. We were very much beginners. We went out to California and we walked in on a session not knowing what it was, an uh, intensive meditation period. And I was lucky enough to hear Suzuki Roshi speak. And as I said, I didn't understand anything he said, both linguistically, his accent was very thick for me, and, uh, and uh, conceptually, I didn't understand it. But I had this experience that when he smiled, it felt as if the walls of the church that we were in bent up with his smile. Mm. And again, I, I trusted, I knew and trusted, even though I hadn't achieved it or couldn't taste it much in my own life, that there was something there that was significant, that was authentic, and something that my soul wanted above all things. Mm. So, uh, you know, that's pretty much what my life has been, trying to unfold what, has, what was already there. Yeah, so something is drawing you, isn't yeah, it? There's yeah. a, like an invisible yeah. force is taking you yeah. the path you need to follow on yes, that level. Yes, they, they bump me around sometimes too. And then you, and then you were with this a guy called Rick Hart, who is yes. ex-Marine. <laughs> yes. How was that? <laughs> that was wild. Um, <laughs> the short version of this story is that um, a fellow named Chester Carlson, who invented Xerox, uh, decided uh, to spend his money on various things and his wife had a pet project called the Little Libraries which were free lending libraries of all the spiritual traditions. And this was actually uh, very karmic for me as well. Uh, the one I wandered into in Brooklyn, she had a few of them, um, was manned by this fellow Rick Hart who uh, was an ex-marine, had a, uh, a hard history, he had had a hard road for himself and he started a kind of zendo in the back where we had a very intensive meditation practice. It was quite intensive. Th one of the important parts of that part of my life was the fact that there was a scroll on the wall. I don't remember the actual wording, but it was something like that which is called Jehovah by the Jews and Allah by the Mohammedans and this, that, may I be that. It went through all the traditions. Mm. 
And that fit right in with this feeling that I had that all the paths led to a single place on the mountain. Yeah. Now, that's not an original thought. People have said that before. But it was something that I needed to work out in my body and soul, which I, I spent many years doing. So uh, I, I learned a lot from Rick Hart, and um, uh, I feel deeply grateful to him. Because psychologically, you had a lot going on, didn't you, from your childhood? Yes. And you put a lot of effort into trying yes. to balance <laughs> and understand that. Yes, I did. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, w which is another, actually looking back on it, it's another blessing for me. Since I had a lot of suffering in my childhood, uh, the family system that I was in was very difficult for me, and I was very sensitive, I had a lot of psychological baggage to work through. And there was another split or another opposite that I needed to reconcile. Do I just go off and become a spiritual person and leave all of that behind? Mm. Or do I just work on this and leave this, these spiritual states I was after behind? Or again, do I reconcile these opposites? Do I bring them together? Do they somehow need each other? Does my highest spiritual intention need a healthy ego, a healthy personality for it to be the vehicle for this awakening. And again, I found myself uh, unable to take a single path. I had to reconcile all of these opposites in my life. And uh, from that perspective, all the suffering I went through as a child was a blessing because it gave me my path. So what were there, just briefly, what did you find was helpful in working on the psychological side? Well, let's put it this way. When we walk into a room as a person who is still suffering unconsciously from our psychological wounds, we have lots of barriers up and uh, threads out into the, into the atmosphere and we're bouncing off this and bouncing off this person and having our own thoughts and it's, it's sort of chaotic. In order to be able to feel the illuminating quality of reality, which is already present, which is not something we bring to reality, but which is already there, we have to be somewhat reconciled within ourselves so that we're not in this constant, intense motion of it's chaos. It's obscuring, isn't it's it? It's obscuring, exactly. Yeah. It's, a good, it's a good way now, to put I, it. I was more looking at what practical methods or teachings did you find helpful in, in terms of that clearing well, process for well, yourself? Well, I went through uh, uh, various forms of psychotherapy. Yes. I was lucky enough to find a master therapist, uh, a fellow named Norman Traeger, who I worked with for a long time, who deeply helped me heal my psychological material. Mm. And then, because I was so attuned to it and so aware of it, part of the healing work that I created, non-dual Kabbalistic healing, has within it a component that works with our psychological difficulties. And uh, people who go through our school, uh, Society of Souls, uh, find that very deep psychological issues are often um, cleared up or, uh, although I should, I should say something about the word cleared up, cleared up for me doesn't mean that it's disappeared. It means that even if it goes on, it's no longer standing in the way. You know what I mean? Yes. It's as if you have, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, a problem it's in your... It's not rigid, it's kind of more free-floating. It's free-floating, so yeah. it's there but it's not obscuring anything anymore. Yeah. It's more of a companion. You know, it's like a tree that has grown up and it's not straight because there was a bad winter one winter and another winter, then it was easy and then it was, and it has a shape. The yeah. shape of that tree never changes. We never change. I had certain sufferings. I have certain inclinations psychologically, but as I am awake to them, as I am aware of them, they don't obscure the light. They're part of my totality of being, you might say. Yeah. 
I know that personal contact was also quite important to you in your journey, wasn't it? It wasn't so much the theory of reading things, it was having personal contact with people. Yes. Um, reading things was actually very, very important for me because reading wasn't abstract. Uh, this kind of sense of being guided my whole life in the sense of being pushed to find the truth also showed itself in the form of books and books would come to me and, and become very, very important and I would uh, dive into them very deeply. And then the books would lead me to people as well and uh, they led me to uh, my meditation practice and everything I was doing, going to the little library, meeting Rick Hart. Uh, then I met my, uh, uh, my soon-to-be wife, who's my, uh, I consider her one of my spiritual teachers and uh, my companion. So that kind of, you know, connection, very, very important for me. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because you, you, you investigate all these different things, but you kept coming back to Judaism, didn't you? Well, I came back to Judaism because I was deeply involved in a Zen Buddhist practice, right? And I knew that Judaism had something called Kabbalah. And I, I felt a little bit of loyalty, you know, need to kind of investigate what my own people had discovered uh, on, on a mystical level. But whenever I read Kabbalah, it was uh, dry, it seemed to me, uh, erudite, uh, distant, uh, highly intellectual and conceptual. And I would go back to it time and again, and it didn't open to me. And then one day, uh, I had a very big experience with it, where the doors of Kabbalah really just opened completely. And uh, for some reason, what I was given to see within uh, Kabbalistic thinking was an implied healing method that had never really been uh, talked about. Uh, there was no literature on it, there was no one who had really um, plumbed its depths. And I understood that uh, I might be able to do this and I spent the next several years writing and doing that until I started working. I was working as a healer at that point and I started working with some of the healings I developed and people started having very positive response, asked me what I was doing, and I told them, and they wanted to study with me, and that's how the school started. That's a whole other story. Uh, but my intention was never to start a school or anything like that. It, it came about because there was a demand for it based on what was, on what was happening. Yeah. We'll come on to the school in a minute, but I want to yeah. cover something very important in your life. Because sure. In 1979, you got very ill. Yes. And you were ill for seven years, which is a long, long time. Mm -hmm. In the first year, you were bedridden. Yes. So what, what actually happened, and how, how did you start to find your way out of that? Well, you know, let's say, let's say this. First, I had to find my way into it. And by that, I mean I had to find rock bottom. I got ill uh, suddenly and stayed ill. And no one was able to find out what I had. Gosh. And I went for all sorts of tests. And uh, no one knew. I was weaker and weaker. I went down to about 135 pounds, which was quite slim for me, much too slim. Um, I was uh, very sick. And when I say find my way into it, I had to get to the point where I had... Um, completely given up, ever possibly getting well. Mm -hmm. And I had to get through a lot of bitterness as to why I couldn't get well. And I had to get to the point where somebody said to me, if this is the way you're going to be your entire life, for the rest of your life, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And I had to decide whether to kill myself or not. And I, I found the fact that despite of the way I was feeling, I didn't want to kill myself. I wanted to live. This was about six years into it. And so you were ill for six years before you actually came to this point? Yeah, yeah. Wow. I, I was a stubborn guy. I mean, that's not, it's, it's not really causal. I don't want to say, like, when I finally found the truth, it opened and changed. There's a certain amount of karma here, and there's a certain amount of just unknown. I don't want to make a storyline that I couldn't stand by. 
but I began to do a number of things, and the sequence is a little fuzzy in my mind, but I started investigating what healing was. I started getting messages about how to be a healer. I was really not so interested in other people at that point, so the idea of working with other people was uh, a totally new concept for me. At the same time, I found a naturopath, I found a psychic healer, and I slowly started to get better. Uh, and simultaneously, I was leaving my job in, in publishing and uh, moving into working with people as a healer. It was a different modality. I hadn't mm -hmm. created my own modality at that point. And my life, I started getting stronger. It's nice to make a narrative that, you know, this kind of traditional narrative that I, I've heard about, that shamans sometimes go through a seven-year illness. Um, it's certainly true in my case. That's what happened. It wasn't chosen, but uh, I guess uh, it was meant to be. Yeah, but also at one point, I understand, you actually feared getting well, too. Well, <laughs> when you're so weak, all of your abilities to have neurotic defenses, you just don't have the energy for them. Mm. So I found myself not only uh, as a very thin human being, but thin in terms of my defenses as well. And therefore, I had, for the first time, a tremendous amount of transparency and give and take and feelings that I was able to cope with. And as I got stronger, well, your muscles get stronger and your armoring gets stronger. So it brought out a vulnerability in yes, you. Yes, well, but getting well, the defenses started reasserting okay, themselves. Okay, okay. Because I was healthy enough to be defended again. Mm -hmm. And I realized I had to do some deep work to maintain my health and yet be someone who was working on uh, his own path. Yeah. And that's what I did. Mm. I found lots of ways to do that. It sounds like a real journey because being so sick for so long, and I yeah. think you also got married during that time and had yes. a child during that time. Yes, yes. So, so much was changing when you actually felt very, very weak. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, Ian, my whole life has been like this. It really? hasn't stopped. Really? Really, I swear to God. Okay. And I'm so grateful for it because I, I keep learning and keep going deeper. And then I think after you'd recovered, there was a particularly significant event in a hotel room where you heard, you heard a sentence, and that sentence stayed with you, and for three years you worked on what you heard. I think you're referring to the time when a I voice was... spoke. Yeah, yeah, when, it, when Kabbalah opened to me. Okay. And I think, I don't remember what the sentence was. I took was, it out it was, of here, so I don't know the exact... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, uh, that's, uh, I, I don't remember. Um, but that was a time when I realized that there was this healing modality uh, uh, within Kabbalah that had never been explored and that, and I, I literally wrote thousands of pages of material working out the, this process, um, which I, how can I put this, again, I knew it in its totality, but it was wordless. I had to do two things, put words to it, to unfold it so it could be explained, and simultaneously work on my personality and my spiritual personality as well uh, so that I could be a good vehicle for this to happen. Okay, so, so you were given like a clue and you had to, yeah. you had to put uh, yeah. I'm a good substance hound dog. on it. I'm a good hound dog. I can follow a trail. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know so much about Kabbalistic healing, so why don't you just briefly explain to us the, the, the bare bones, if you like, without going into too much detail, of what Kabbalistic healing is. Well, Kabbalistic healing is, uh, hmm, is based on the theme of this universe, as far as I understand it, which is relationship. The relationship that Kabbalah talks about is exemplified in a, in a, a diagram called the Etz Chaim, the Tree of Life. Many people have seen this. And really, it's an extremely erudite and deep image of what the connected universe is like, including ourselves, including everything that is, including God, humans, and so on. We work very deeply with the spherot, which are these uh, emblematic 
uh, figures of uh, this universal consciousness, various aspects of God. And we're not working with the human aura. We're not working with chakras. We're working, I, I like to say to my students sometimes, we're working in the factory where energy is created. So I, the only way I could talk about that realm is to call it the creative milieu. We're working in the level of creation itself, which is the level of consciousness itself. And the healer learns to embody these various subtle conditions along with a very, very artful diagnostic process, which is a process of communication. It's not a, it's not a characterological process that hones down the person until we find out what's wrong with you. Really, we find out the totality of your being how you are relating, what your relationship is through the diagnostic process. And then the healer, having learned these very subtle states of consciousness, cleaves to that consciousness in certain ways, which by a kind of resonance helps the, uh, the person who's come to them. So you've used words, you just used resonance, and earlier you knew you used a relationship. Mm -hmm. And you also use the word factory, where energy is created. Mm -hmm. So it's a bringing together. So a relationship means, I guess, a degree of presence between the Absolutely. healer and the to be he healed. Absolutely. And, and through the presence, a resonance is, is generated, although it's not done by doing. Is that right? It's, it, well, it's a a tre there's, a tremendous, there's a tremendous effort put out by the healer that's not doing. They do something, but it's not being done to. We're not doing anything to you in, okay. in that particular way. Another way to look at this, if we look at it from the Advaitic point of view or the Buddhist point of view, the real nature of reality is that it's a single thing, as the Shema says. So this relationship and this what we're calling a resonance is really a... Um, is really bringing to the surface the deepest truth of, uh, of unity. And when we are in disease, when we're in uncomfortableness, when we're in neuroses, we're not really in relationship at that point. So there's been a disconnection with unity. There's been a disconnection with awareness, okay. I would say. Because, you know, we, as human beings, we may always be discontinuous to some extent. Uh, I'm not very big on an ideal state. That's not part of my vocabulary. Uh, that we will get to some ideal state that um, we won't have these things. My aim is to heal people with the totality of their beings, which means with their ignorance, with their selfishness, with their courage, with their greatness, with their smallness. My belief is that when we are real human beings and awake to all of that, we're in optimal condition. And the body can tend to heal itself the best at that moment. The mind and the spirit as well. But, you see, you're inferring that human beings as such can be optimal. But, as you said, there's just one, really. So... I would challenge the fact that a human being is going to be optimal as such. I guess we can be, on a human level, relatively in tune, but optimum reply, implies separation. Well, it's an interesting statement. In the view that I have, the only way you can have oneness is by having separation. It's all part of, it's all part yeah. of the same thing. Yeah. If, we, if we don't have separation, I can't ever really be one with you. Then I'm merged with you and I have no separate identity. I don't think that's the point of human life. I don't think the point of human life is to dissolve ourselves so that we have no identity. As I've said uh, in the past, uh, God keeps creating separate egos all the time. I don't think it was a mistake. Okay. I think, I think there's something up and there's something very intelligent about that. Uh, the Buddhists put it a different way. They say samsara, our world of separateness and duality, and nirvana, the world of unity, are one. 
So these things need each other. So the separateness is very important in our work because it leads to oneness, and oneness gives birth to separateness. It's a, a, an extremely beautiful thing. It's like these flowers here, which we're very happy that they're separate on every level, from us and from each color, makes it very beautiful. That's awakening, as far as I'm concerned. And something I picked up from what you wrote was that ego has, it, has within it the kernel of oneness. You know, our egos, um, our egos are fantastic creatures, really. And the problem with the ego is not that it exists. There are a lot of spiritual teachers who have a, a belief that we have to transcend the ego or see through the ego or bypass the ego or something like that. Again, that would be like bypassing my hand because it sometimes uh, <laughs> unconsciously hits me in the face. It's part of me, and the ego, when it's integrated, when it's healed, integrates into uh, the totality of our being so that um, uh, we uh, maintain our humanity in a healthy, open, transparent, and Buddha-like way, if I might say that. Mm. So the ego, you know, I have a chapter in one of my books, uh, Kabbalistic Healing, called The Holy Ego. And that's what I believe that the ego needs to be healed and integrated and then it reveals itself as the perfect vehicle for enlightening living, for uh, uh, awakening. Yeah, I've, I've, heard an, I've heard another kind of view which is quite similar to yours, which is that the ego is in one way an imperfect reflection of something that's real. It's like the, I say, imperfect reflection because it's got distorted but there is also a reality and a truth within that. Absolutely, absolutely. Again, it's the truth of separateness, the truth of background and foreground, and it's imperfect because we've been given miseducation. We've been given uh, confused messages. We've grown up in uh, cultures that have neuroses with parents who are not realized beings and so on. Uh, so our education has been very poor. When our ego is re-educated, however, it's exactly what it should be. It takes its place and it's, in fact, the embodiment of beauty. Individuality, this flower, is beautiful because it's just itself. Likewise, when we are just ourselves, and our, including our egos, we're a beautiful thing. We love our mates and partners and children because they are just who they are. And that has something to do with an integrated ego, of course. How, how do the words awakening and enlightenment fit into the Kabbalistic tradition? Well, Kabbalah doesn't talk too much in that way. It talks about, it talks about being with God, doing God's will, uh, being in the presence of God, um, uh, worshiping Hashem, uh, and so on. But there's no question that there were uh, Hasidic masters and many Jewish sages who were illuminated beings. The language of awakening and enlightenment, or enlightening, as I like to say, really, as you know, comes much more from, from Zen Buddhism, from Advaita, from the Hindu tradition, and so on. For me, there's no difference. Once I was able to reconcile the, uh, the linear deistic path of God and us and the non-dual path, the absolute path of Advaita, once those became one thing for me, words like awakening and being with God are identical. They are just different takes on a central idea, depending upon what part of the continuum of who we are is speaking. What who is is speaking. Mm -hmm. From the position of one who is, which is a very separate one, God appears as a subject or an object to our subject and there's separateness. That path can lead to illumination also. On the other end of the spectrum we have uh, people whose ego is so deeply integrated that there's no I and thou. There's one single thing. 
illumination can happen there too. And it can happen all the way along this entire continuum that represents, you know, the differences that we all have in our uh, abilities and karma, uh, destiny, our fate, our education, and so on. My, again, my belief is everybody can experience from their own position uh, some form of awakening. It doesn't have to look the same way for each person. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't. Not everything's a rose. We want daisies as well, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I get, personally, I get more and more fascinated by this idea of um, the, the premise and the understanding and the, and the embodiment like of, of everything is the ground of being is something that gets more and more obvious, if you like, or more and more tangible. And it's the thing of so much in society, it's the encouragement to say this is separate from me and this is right and this is wrong. And if we look at yeah. religion or <coughs> nationalistic <coughs> politics, it's this side, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, if, we take your, if we take Israel and the Arabs, one is right, one is wrong. And of course, as you, have you realized from an early age, things are not polarized. Somewhere there's a bringing together and somewhere oh. the truth encompasses rather than defines. Right, right, and that right. becomes more and more interesting if you take it into duality and non-duality and, duali and duality being part of non-duality. Right. It just, it takes you on a, <coughs> it doesn't take you because there's no one to take, but it, 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 the journey gets more and more fascinating because you actually realize that everything is this one tapestry, this one, one organism which has different forms, you say the flower, the human being or whatever, it is all one thing and we somehow, I know in, in, within a day in myself I can catch myself in separateness and it's almost as if an hour later there's an understanding right. and a feeling. Absolutely. Of it's I, all happening. I agree 100%. The way we work with this in, in my work is with a, a notion called running and returning which is an old Kabbalistic phrase from a, an ancient book called the Sefer HaYisra. Running and returning the way it's traditionally used means that human beings run toward God and run away from God. The separateness and oneness that you just yes. described. My attitude toward that is if we're only thinking that we can be with God and that we're going to get better and better and better until we can be with God all the time, we're out of luck. We're just out of luck because that's not what human life is about. From my perspective, human life is about running and returning. It's about both. And finding God means finding God when, God, when you're with God and finding God when God seems to be absent. Mm. That the bracketing around those two things needs to be so large, so inclusive, that we find that we can never leave God or our Buddha nature because of conditions. That it's, <laughs> it's in the shadows and it's in the light. It's not just in the light. It's in something that shadow and light are both in. Is that making sense? Am I making... No, that? absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, there's oneness and there's the oneness of duality. It's the manifestation of oneness is duality. Yes. And, and I'll say one last thing. We have a work called the Magi Process. The Magi Process attempts to heal conflict, internal conflict and political mm. conflict and conflict between people from a non-dual perspective. And it's a very exciting and interesting 38-step process that people go through to kind of get into the machinery of reality and We've been having a lot of interesting experiences and success with that. Maybe someday we'll get to talk about that as well. Mm. So, uh, yeah. So, let, let, let's say, Jason, someone who's watching this program that is somehow a little bit intrigued with what we're talking about, and doesn't know much about Kabbalistic healing or non-duality or anything else, what is like a starting point for the, for the uninitiated, uninitiated? Well, um, 
I think, I think a good way, not to be terribly self-serving, but the easiest way is to go on our website. And the reason I send people to the website, should I give the name of the website? I'll tell you. It's, it's Absolutely, go for it. www.societyofsouls.com. Uh, there's a video archive on there of talks that I've given. That it's all free. And you can hear me talking about psychological suffering, about uh, imperfection, about illumination, uh, from various points of view. And I think that would be a very easy, some of the talks are from five minutes to maybe 13, 14 minutes, a very easy way for people to kind of get into the spirit of what I'm trying to talk about. They could read Kabbalistic Healing, uh, one of my books. It's called Kabbalistic Healing, A Path to an Awakened Soul. And they can, they can go on the site, and if they want, they can buy lectures and things like that that are all available. The reason I send people to, to my site is mainly because that's been my life's work. My life's work is to have reconciled these opposites of, of the absolute and, and uh, duality, of the personal ego and the universal self of um, imperfection and perfection, the transcendent and the imminent. That's really been, uh, so I'm kind of the, the guy who's talking a lot about this and has articulated it in ways that I think can help people. It's not a path, I'm trying to articulate a path that's not um, idealistic so that it doesn't become an idol. It doesn't become something that we can't achieve uh, it becomes something that we can... I'm very interested, Ian, in people being illuminated and having a job. Yes. I want it to be useful. Yes. I want it to actually change their life with their mates and partners, with uh, uh, the, uh, the bus driver and uh, with the person who works for them or who they work for. Uh, I want it to have actual practical results rather than to be a theoretical uh, insular, isolated uh, illumination where someone uh, begins to uh, talk softly and bow a lot and, and nothing has really changed. Yeah, I call that being in the world but not of the world. You're living in the marketplace but you're not just caught in the drama of the marketplace. We need to live in the marketplace, right? Yes. The marketplace needs a lot of help. So, how is your journey, where is your own personal journey going now? Wow. Well, it's, it's been a wild ride recently. The school's been around for 20 years, and I've trained a number of people. And uh, I, it was clear to me that at some point I want to change my work, and I want our work in the school to continue. So um, I have a Dharma heir. Her name is Brenda Blessings. And she's going to, over the next few years, transition to being head of the school which is going to uh, do two things. She's a very creative and powerful person, and I'm hoping that she'll bring uh, the school into a, a whole new level and allow people from all over the world to have contact with these teachings. And it's going to allow me to walk into the unknown again, which is um, exciting and scary to walk into the unknown and figure out you know, what am I going to be doing? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm writing. I'm doing a lot of writing because there's a lot of thoughts I want to get down. Um, I'm meditating a lot. I'm thinking a lot. And I'm wondering exactly what's going to happen. I'm, I'm interested in working with advanced students, continuing that piece, uh, because I find it very interesting and exciting to work with people who are on the verge of awakening. And that's fantastic for me. And also, maybe doing some sort of intensives with people who want to work for a week at a time with, my, with me and my wife, because she works with me a lot, um, where we, we do this advanced work, which is maybe focused on body, mind, and soul, the whole thing. So, you know, these are some of the thoughts that I have. And a lot of it is like, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I need to walk on the beach for a few years and, and, and let, the, uh, let the waves inform me <laughs> as to what's going to happen.
It is this process of letting go, isn't it? It is. And it and does take a lot of courage to keep... Well, I've got to tell you, I never expected to let go of anything. And my life has been about letting go of everything. Yeah. And uh, now this thing that I created, uh, I'm trying to let go of it so that it can live, right? That's how things live. They move on to the next people. And there are some wonderful people who um, uh, I uh, have, have taught, who are teaching in the school now, who I learn from. And um, so it's an, exciting and, uh, it's an exciting moment for me. Okay. We have about four minutes left. Anything you want to say in the last four minutes about, uh, about your work or about your life? No. I, I would say if I had four minutes, I would want to um, encourage anybody who's listening to this to not give up. I would want to encourage people to, um, to um, you, uh, you know, a, a story occurs to me. This is, happens to be a Christian story, but let's translate it. In an old book called the Pistis Sophia, which is a mystical Christian book, there's a story about what happens to Christ in the three days before he's resurrected. The Pistis Sophia says he goes to hell. Why would Jesus go to hell? My interpretation of that is that he wanted to go to a place that was as dark as could be, right? And even there, you could find light. Mm. So his, his presence had to be down, all the way down, so that any being could find light. Mm. Now let's take that out of the Christian-only marketplace and say that I, I would like people never to give up. Find someone to help you that illuminating our human life is possible, that we really can uh, open up to our humanity and paradoxically opening up to our suffering in the right way, to our limitations in the right way, uh, brings liberation. And I just want people to know that, and uh, I want people to be happy. And it's kind of what you did when you had your seven years of illness. Yeah. Because you went right down, and then somewhere there was still light there because you found wow. in a different form your way out. Yeah, I'm blessed. I'm absolutely blessed. You're right. I never thought of it that way, but you're absolutely right, Ian. Thank you for saying that. And there's probably a way out for everybody, isn't there? I think so. Yeah. For most people. For most people. And, and especially since people listening to this, we have to realize how lucky we are. Yeah. We're not in a war zone. We have enough food to eat. We have a certain amount of peace, even if it's uh, difficult right now, uh, monetarily, financially, and so on. Use this peace. Use this time, this respite in the world's difficulties to do all you can to um, uh, have a whole heart. Yeah. There's some very moving books. I've read a couple recently about people on death row in America mm -hmm. and how they're going to die and they're living in pretty bad conditions and yeah. yet they find for them light yeah. and hope even yeah. though death is imminent. Yeah. It's, uh, that's pretty extreme. It's imminent for all of us in a strange yeah. way, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. That's right. Jason, thanks very much for coming on to talk to some very welcome. TV. I really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you. And uh, I haven't got a copy of Kabbalistic Healing, where this is Jason's latest book, and also the instruction manual for receiving God I do have, and here's a copy of that. So thanks very much again for watching Conscious TV, and I hope we see you again in the near future. Goodbye. <laughs>